Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Denise O'Hagan, and I'm presenting today with my colleague Gillian Armstrong. I'm a consultant in public health medicine, and Gillian is a registrar in public health. And uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit about a piece of work that um, was carried out mainly as a dissertation project, as a master's in public health by Gillian. Uh, but I work in general in the field of suicide prevention in the other part of my job in the public health agency. So you're getting it from a sort of general public health approach and then a little bit of research that we've carried out as part of a dissertation project. So just to give you an overview, um, we're going to talk about the issues of anxiety problems and sleep problems and their possible relationship to suicidal behaviour. And when we think of suicide, we, we often talk about it in the context largely of, of depression and serious mental illnesses. And today we're going to explore it in, in the context of anxiety and sleeping problems, and not just the problems, but also the drugs that are used to treat these issues. And the drugs are generally very much the same in terms of anxiety and sleeping disorders, which is why we've, we've put them together. So first of all, we'll look at the prevalence of these issues, some of the, the recommended uh, treatment and management strategies, the relationships between uh, these issues and suicidal behaviours, and then the background to our research question, which is largely, largely focusing on the drug treatment. And the results of the systematic literature review, which has been carried out, and some cautions regarding interpretation, and finally, make some recommendations. So, how common are these issues? Well, anxiety is very common, and I'm quoting some research now that uh, Siobhan has probably been involved with. Uh, anxiety disorder in Northern Ireland, a study uh, carried out by the University of Ulster, showed that over a 12-month period, 14.6% of the population experienced anxiety. And across a lifetime, about 23% um, experience anxiety disorder. It's very common, uh, sorry, insomnia is also very common, and UK studies have shown around about one in three of the population experience uh, insomnia. And that is often persistent, with almost 70% of people who experience insomnia continuing to experience it a year later. And for those who don't, uh, experience insomnia in, in this particular study over the course of the next year 15% developed it so very common issues now in terms of uh, recommendations for treatment and management of these conditions I've just outlined some of the strategies recommended here by NICE and for those of you who are not that familiar that's the National Institute for Clinical and Social Care Excellence so they make recommendations around the, the treatment and management of a whole range of, of health issues so generally, the, the first step in the management of anxiety, well, they, they recommend a stepped care model, so progressively going through the steps as the severity of the problem increases. But the initial steps at step one and step two are really about just actively monitoring the situation by your GP or, or yourself, and some guided self-help. So using self-help resources and getting a little bit of help from a healthcare professional to help you work through those self-help resources, and also psychoeducation. So educating yourself and trying to apply some of those strategies that you have learned. So that, that's sort of the initial strategies. And then progressively, if those things aren't working or the condition becomes more severe, working up through to some drug treatments. But NICE doesn't recommend using um, drug treatments um, really in, in situations of, except in situations of crisis, and only then for really short-term issues. So they recommend do not offer a benzodiazepine for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, uh, except as a short-term measure during crises. So a benzodiazepine, such as diazepam, Valium, that many of you be, may be familiar with, is, is the type of drug they're referring to here. And similarly for insomnia, I'll not go through the details here, but generally ruling out any causes of insomnia, trying other strategies, and finally, short-term use of these sorts of drugs, if they are required, is what's recommended. Now, we know that these drugs are commonly used, and despite the recommendations of NICE, they are very commonly prescribed, and they're also used illicitly, obtained via the internet or on the black market in some other respects. So in terms of Northern Ireland, we're aware through the Drug Prevalence Survey in 2014-15 um, of the, the statistics uh, there. Now, it's, it's very small and you can't see it, but across the lifetime, about 21% of people use a sedative or a tranquilizer drug and that's 10% have used such drugs in the past year and 7% in the past month. So very commonly used drugs. And we know as well that they're used much more so in deprived communities. 
um, people living in the most deprived quintiles, so that's the most deprived 20% of the population, are twice as likely as those in the least deprived group to have used a sedative or a tranquilizer in the past year. So moving on then into the links with suicidal behaviour or into exploring the links in relation to this. There was a systematic review carried out um, in 2013 which, which looked at the relationship between anxiety and suicidal disorders. And they tried to exclude the fact that someone may be also suffering from depression. Um, so they, they pulled together a lot of research papers that had uh, looked at the relationships between anxiety and suicide. They excluded people where they were suffering from depression and anxiety, and they, um, they tried to control for depression uh, in this. So they did find um, that there was an association between anxiety and various types of suicidal behaviour, both just in terms of the thoughts or attempted suicides or completed suicide or indeed any of these, they found an increased risk across all of those issues. And you can see there are the statistics for those of you who are statistically minded. There was a similar systematic review carried out looking at a relationship with insomnia in the context of any psychiatric disorder. And again, they found an elevated risk of suicidal behaviours. But obviously these people do have underlying psychiatric issues. So from that piece of research, or those pieces of research, there is a need for GPs and other professionals who are working with people who have anxiety only and not necessarily depression to be aware that there is a suicidal risk or suicidal behaviour risk associated with anxiety. But there are likely to be other confounding factors or explanations there that, that uh, might explain some of the observations that we've seen. Now, just in terms of the background to the particular piece of work then that Gillian embarked on, the, the previous uh, systematic reviews there that I referred to suggested an increased risk associated with anxiety. We know that drug treatment is often used in the management of anxiety, uh, often sometimes appropriately and uh, sometimes perhaps not appropriately in, in line with the guidance. But we came across this paper by Mock et al. in 2013 and this uh, was carried out by a research, a research team in Manchester, and they were asked to look at why does England have a higher, sorry, why does Scotland have a higher suicide rate than England, and what factors might explain that? And one of the findings was that, um, in bold type there, the prescription of psychotropic drugs was the variable most strongly associated between the differences between the countries in terms of their suicide risk, and accounted for 42% of the dif of the, the differential. So that's leading us uh, to, to ask a number of questions and to think about what are the explanations for that. And the explanations or possible explanations offered in that paper was that the, the, the high use of the drugs was reflecting the high, higher prevalence perhaps of mental ill health problems in Scotland. It may also re reflect the prescribing practices of doctors. It may reflect the help seeking behaviours of patients that they're going to the doctor and requesting a medication. And it may reflect perhaps the alternatives that are open to doctors in terms of whether they prescribe or whether they recommend self-help strategies or referral to counselling or other therapies. So a whole range of possible explanations there. But it did raise the issue about, in my mind at least, well, well, what is the relationship between the drugs and the suicidal issue here? And is there a possibility that the drugs could be in some way implicated here? So... Um, Starting to think about this then in the context of Northern Ireland, oops, sorry. we know that we have higher rates of suicide in Northern Ireland and self-harm and we have a higher burden of mental illness uh, than other parts of the UK. There are higher rates of prescribing of the various drugs to treat psychiatric conditions in the UK, that, in Northern Ireland than in other parts of the UK. And we know from our self-harm registry which looks at what drugs were taken during acts of self-harm when someone presents to the emergency department, we know that benzodiazepines, which is a drug frequently used to treat insomnia or anxiety, they're used in a large proportion of overdose attempts or self-harm uh, acts. So it's 31% in Northern Ireland, 42% in the Republic of Ireland, and in England uh, I've come across variable statistics ranging from about 13% to 19%. So Quite high in terms of Northern Ireland. Um, there are issues around access to drugs as well in terms of we have our free prescriptions and people when they self-harm will often use just what is available to them. 
We also have data from Northern Ireland, which has identified through coroner's uh, files that Siobhan and colleagues have looked at that benzodiazepines are detected in 24% of suicides at post-mortem. But we also know that only about half of suicides have toxicology screening carried out. So the true proportion of benzodiazepines in suicides um, may be much higher than that. We also know that um, historically benzodiazepine use has been very high in Northern Ireland and at the bottom of the slide there you'll see between 1966 and 76, so around the peak times of the Troubles, there was a threefold increase in the prescription of benzodiazepines. So a range of statistics there in relation to um, the usage of these drugs in Northern Ireland and uh, in the context of suicidal behaviours. We can see on this graph, or perhaps you can't do it to the, the size, but the three bars on the right relate to the um, prescribing of benzodiazepines and similar drugs for, uh, in Northern Ireland. And you can also see there England, Wales and Scotland. So Northern Ireland is significantly higher than the other three UK countries. Now it has been coming down slightly over recent years and there are efforts uh, in place across a range of agencies to help with that. But you can see Northern Ireland is significantly higher than others. So this has raised uh, some questions for us in terms of use of psychotropic medications and possible associations and linkages um, with suicide. So that uh, was the background to the, the, the piece of work then that Gillian was asked to carry out as part of her dissertation and some work that has emerged from that since. So Gillian first uh, carried out a systematic review looking at the relationship between antidepressant prescribing and suicide, and there was nothing really of much significance identified there. But we are aware, and you, many of you may be aware of media reports about possible increases of suicide in prescribing for young people with uh, particular groups of antidepressant drugs. But Gillian's literature review didn't identify anything concerning in relation to that. We then progressed to look at anxiolytic drugs, so that's drugs for anxiety and suicide, and then finally narrowed it down to benzodiazepines and suicide. So that's the, the bit of work that Gillian is going to talk to you about now in a moment. But just to put that in context as well, these drugs for anxiety and sleeping problems do have a range of adverse effects. They can cause dependence, they can cause a range of cognitive and psychomotor impairments, they can make someone more likely to fall. And there has been recent research indicating that they are associated with an increase in all-cause mortality, so an increase in death from across all, all causes. So we're, we're not sure, and Gillian is going to talk to you about now, you know, the, the implications in that in terms of its relationship to suicide. We know that people using benzodiazepines have an increased rate of death, but whether that is, uh, has any relationship with suicide, we're going to hear about now in a moment. So I'll hand over to Gillian to take you. So my role was to review the previously published literature on this topic to look to see is there any evidence for or against an, an association between benzodiazepine use and suicide. And I conducted a systematic re review of the literature back in August 2014. I searched five different databases which include a range of medical, um, psychological and social sciences to capture the breadth of the research on suicide. And the studies we were really interested in were population-based observational study designs, and that's really the nature of the beast. Um, suicide is a relatively rare outcome in terms of studying it in medical terms, and um, it's not something we can do randomised controlled trials on, so we really just have to look to what is happening and what observations can we associate with that. The intervention that we focus on in this particular project was benzodiazepines in specific and all the various types of those, and the outcome was completed suicide. So there was no previous literature review identified on this topic. Um, I identified just over a thousand records and went through all of those and narrowed that down to 18 studies that met the final inclusion criteria. There's quite a range of different study designs that we identified and I'm going to talk you through a number of the key studies that there are and a summary of the toxicology studies as that was the biggest group. So the first study is the Nurses' Health Study, which was published back in 2002. This was a large study conducted in America where they observed over 94,000 female nurses over a 14-year period. Over that entire period, there were 73 suicides within the cohort. And at various time points during this period of observation, the nurses were sent out a questionnaire to complete upon many aspects of their lifestyle, but including uh, measures of stress and also use of uh, benzodiazepines. So 
Of the 73 suicides, 14% of them had been prescribed diazepam, and compared to the nurses who hadn't committed suicide, that was much higher. There was only 3% had been prescribed diazepam. So the authors concluded that diazepam use was significantly protective of suicide, and the risk was higher in women who'd taken diazepam for a, a long period of time, over three years. Um, they tried to look at whether it's related to the stress and, and therefore the diazepam use, um, but stress itself only accounted for about a three-fold increase of risk, and the um, benzodiazepines appeared to be a five-fold increase of risk, so it seems to be a combination of events there. The next study I identified was a case control study which was published in Manchester and it was a population in England of over 16 year olds and it was a case control study so they matched um, cases of suicide for age, gender and GP practice with other patients who were, who were alive and there was quite a number of suicides in this, over 2,000. 19% of those who completed suicide were on a benzodiazepine compared to only 3% of the controls. So they found an increased risk of sevenfold for patients who were on a benzodiazepine. They also found that people who completed suicide were five times more likely to be diagnosed with a mental health diagnosis. Um, so again, it's difficult to pick out you know, which, is, which is the problem here, but they definitely concluded that people who are on benzodiazepines are at higher suicide risk, and in particular people who were on benzodiazepines and antidepressants were on a much, had a much higher increased risk of suicide of 18-fold, and they suggested putting a flag on people's medical records just to alert GPs to that possibility. Another case control study was conducted in British Columbia. Now, this study was different in that it was looking at elderly population of over 65s. Again, a case control study, and there were 602, 602 suicides identified with five controls for every case. Um, they did adjust for confounders like socioeconomic status, depression, anxiety, and a variety of other um, medical conditions like chronic pain and cancer. And again, they found that a lot more people who committed suicides were on benzodiazepines compared to the controls, 28% compared to 5%. So they said use of benzos is associated with a fourfold increased risk of suicide. Um, their conclusions were that benzodiazepines in the elderly population were at particular risk, and that should be noted to prescribers. So just to summarise, those four studies um, of, have all identified an increased risk of, of suicide with the use of benzodiazepines of between four and seven fold. Moving into some other types of study designs, now these were more um, of the observational time trend studies. This study was published in Denmark and it was over a 30 year period from 1970 to 2000. And over that period of time, they noticed a 10% increase in prescribing of benzos. And associated with that, there was an increased suicide rate in men of 6% and in women of 10%. So it's, again, difficult to disentangle a cause and effect, but they observed this effect of increased prescribing and increased suicide. Other explanations could obviously be offered as well. Sweden conducted a, a very similar time trend study from 1969 to 96. Um, they only looked at the elderly, so this is a subgroup of that population. And interestingly found um, that benzo prescribing in the elderly had gone down, but suicide rates had gone up. But they noted that um, the type of suicides was different that they were looking at. They found that um, in this elderly population, self-poisoning was the, the most common method of committing suicide, and that benzos were the, the dominant drug in that. So it doesn't quite fit with the, all the other research, but again, it's an interesting subpopulation. -sub so, moving on, 13 remaining studies were all toxicology studies of completed suicide, and they were gathered from around the world, England, Wales, America, the Scandinavian countries, Brazil and Australia, um, and they found a range of different prevalence of benzodiazepines on completed toxicology. Now, as we've heard earlier, uh, not all suicides will have toxicology report completed. Um, in the Scandinavian countries, it's virtually all suicides, and some of the others, it would be more in and around 60 to 70% of suicides. But each and every study found that benzos were detected in a much greater proportion of the population than you would predict from prescribing trends, um, and that ranged 
from 10% at the lowest up to 51%. They said, the, in general, there would seem to be a stronger relationship with older people, which seems to fit with the other subgroup study that I've just talked about. Um, and it was more commonly found in those who completed suicide by fatal poisoning than by other methods. So those are the references to those studies. Um, so just to sum that up, there's been quite a number of studies that have observed an increased risk of suicide associated with benzodiazepine use. Some of those are very in quality and some of them have adjusted for confounders, others have not. The risk does appear to be largest in the elderly. And a note of caution regarding the interpretation of this, as I said, these are observational studies. Um, there's a mixed quality of these studies and some of the studies are ecological and some an observation you see at a population level might not hold true for an individual. For example, I'm sure there are people out there that their benzodiazepines are very helpful to them, so it's, this is not going to apply to everybody by any stretch. Use of benzodiazepines is often a marker that there is an underlying mental health problem or there are difficulties going on, and these are known risk factors for suicide. And again, there may be other confounding factors that could account for this observation um, that haven't been fully explored. So we do feel that there is more research needed to fully tease out this issue. And I'll hand over back to Denise at this point. So in conclusion, um, Gillian has demonstrated that she has found an association, um, so a relationship between these two things. But we cannot, by any uh, means at this stage, say it's a, it's a causal relationship possibly explained by mental health issues underlying it and possibly other confounding factors. But nevertheless, uh, for other reasons, and the reasons that I outlined earlier in the presentation of the, the risks of dependence, the risks of falls, the risks of cognitive impairment, all the other risks that go, uh, that are associated with these drugs, I think there is a need to make sure we are prescribing appropriately and, and uh, doing what we can to ensure that where they are used, they're used appropriately. And... Uh, a need for some further research. So I've outlined some uh, recommendations here, and I'll, I'll just go through these. Um, so in terms of the, what's recommended here, some of this work is ongoing, much of it is, in fact. Um, so just to perhaps let you know what is ongoing, what we could perhaps strengthen and, um, and add to. So ensure access to a range of appropriate interventions for people experiencing anxiety and insomnia in line with the NICE guidance and to raise awareness among the public about the non-pharmacological, in other words, the non-drug related approaches to dealing with both anxiety and sleeping problems. I don't think any media uh, coverage or any public information campaign should make any reference to the, the links or the possibility of links to suicide at this stage, because as I said, we need further research and the, the relationship is by no means clear at this uh, point, but we, we have highlighted an issue which requires some further research. We need to ensure that suicide prevention initiatives take account of the evidence relating to suicide risk associated with anxiety. Um, as I said earlier at the start, we often think of suicide in the context of depression and more serious mental illnesses, but there is evidence emerging there that anxiety itself can be uh, associated with suicide and suicidal behaviours. To continue surveillance, so monitoring, in other words, of benzodiazepine prescribing, particularly in relation to the long-term use of it, um, the, the NICE guidance did recommend that short-term use in particular situations may be okay, but where it's used for prolonged periods of time, that is probably not appropriate and uh, needs to be um, addressed, and perhaps focusing particularly on the elderly. To continue to work with GPs to promote appropriate prescribing as per various action plans that are in, currently in place across the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, the Health and Social Care Board, and other agencies. The importance of continuing to work with GP practices in relation to promoting that appropriate prescribing. There are pharmacists who, pharmacists who do work with GPs particularly on this. They go into practices, they identify practices that are high prescribers and they work with them to address people who are on these drugs for long periods of time and perhaps inappropriately to try to drive uh, that down and we have seen good success there. Um, so we need to continue to do that and perhaps roll out the, the good initiatives that are working in some parts of the province and perhaps focus on the elderly, as Gillian highlighted, perhaps an increased risk in the elderly. Evidence-based programmes to reduce benzodiazepine prescribing, and there is a very good model in the Southeastern Trust area, which has driven down um, the rates there, and I'll show you a graph in a moment which, which will highlight that. And in the 
English Chief Medical Officer's report um, a couple of years ago, she did highlight that a project in the Southeastern Trust on this very issue was very successful and was held up as a good model uh, for other UK regions to, to implement. We need to ensure care and prescribing for those who are at risk of self-harm and suicide. So if an individual does require a benzodiazepine to be prescribed for whatever reason, that GPs uh, and others who are prescribing are aware of the possibility of self-harm and suicide in these individuals. And also prescribing within a household. If there is an individual within a household who is at risk of suicide and their mother, grandmother, whatever, needs benzodiazepines, the risk to access that medication within a household also needs to be borne in mind when prescribing. So that's to reduce access to means of self-harm and suicide. As Siobhan clearly highlighted earlier, access to means is very important. And perhaps advising prescribers about using specific benzodiazepines that are less toxic in overdose, as there are differences between individual drugs. Consider the introduction of quality initiatives in the management of sleep and anxiety disorders in primary care, and perhaps including in the, the quality payments um, that, that are made to, to GP practices, the, the COAF. Consider use of information technology systems in primary care to flag up patients who are on benzodiazepines and, anti and or antidepressants who may be at increased risk of suicide. And that recommendation comes from uh, the National Confidential Aquarian Team in Manchester. Consider the feasibility and affordability of toxicology screening in all cases of suicide to get a better understanding of this issue and other suicide issues uh, at the individual level. We have seen some population-based studies looking at it at uh, larger geographical regions, but to really get a true understanding at individual level what's happening, um, you, you would need to understand what drugs are present uh, at the time of death. And as we said earlier, only about half of all suicide cases in Northern Ireland have toxicology carried out. Continue to address the issue of prescription drug misuse. So we've talked a lot about prescribing to date and appropriate prescribing, but there's a lot of drug misuse that goes on. So in terms of sharing medication, ordering medication on the internet um, and ob obtaining medications on the streets, uh, there is a big illicit issue here as well, which also needs to be continued to be, to be addressed through multi-agency uh, plans. And there is a lot of work already ongoing in that area um, in terms of drug misuse, but. Obviously, anything that can be done to strengthen that would be very welcomed. And to continue to strengthen efforts to address the, address the illicit access, uh, as I've said, and highlight a, a, an operation that is going on across uh, a range of European countries there. And some further research would perhaps help to shed a wee bit more light on this because it's by no means clear cut at the minute, but looking into further help, research around help seeking, prescribing patterns, um, GPs' access to alternatives and whether that increases their likelihood of prescribing, looking at the age profile of people who are using these drugs and, and the duration of use and the illicit use in suicides. Uh, we, we, we know quite a bit about the prescribing, but the, the illicit use is very unclear to us at the moment. So that's all in terms of recommendations. And as I said, much of that work is already ongoing, and I don't think there's anything very clear cut coming out of our research that would lead us to do anything dramatically different at this point uh, other than highlight the need for further research. Um, just to go back to this slide, which I showed to you earlier, on the right hand side you can see the very high rates of prescribing in Northern Ireland, so the three bars on the right as compared to the other countries. But you can see on the, the graph on the right, this is broken down across each of the five geographical healthcare trusts or commissioning groups in Northern Ireland. You can see that the second set of three bars, that's the Southeastern Trust, that's the region where I said that very good initiative to reduce benzodiazepine prescribing was happening. And they, they have a considerably lower um, rate of prescribing than the other four areas. So that intervention uh, would be worth rolling out to, to all other areas. So that's all I have to say. I'm happy to take any questions later. Thank you.